are continuing through our series, um, moving along with our Bible reading, and uh, hopefully you are enjoying that. We talked last week about Jesus, this righteous and eternal judge that has made his appearance. Uh, we used Luke to discuss that, and contrasting that with these heroes in the book of Judges that um, not very heroic, my personal opinion. They uh, remind me of the curse that we seem to find ourselves under. Uh, it's a bit like that confession that Paul makes in the book of Romans where he says that he knows what he ought to do, but that is not what he does. And these heroes of faith in Judges know what they ought to do, but that does not seem to be the world that they live in. And we need to be reminded in the middle of that that we too need to abandon our false God. We need to reject the corrupt culture around us. And we need to be transformed by Jesus, this righteous, eternal judge, because only he can save us. Only he can rescue us. Only he can make us right with God again. Jesus is the only path to that. I mean, the book of Judges sure helps with that, doesn't it, Bill? Jesus is the only one who's actually going to be able to do that. He must be lifted up. So as we begin with John, this Jesus must be lifted up because he is the only one who is worthy of glory. We must glorify him. There is no other way to be made right with God again. Honestly, I was um, excited to leave the book of Judges as fast as I could. I really uh, don't enjoy it. Mostly because I remember a lot of the stories in the book of Judges from when I was a child. And they just don't seem to be singing. The sinfulness of humanity seems to be so glaringly present that not even Gideon can make me feel better. Because, did you read about his sons? Oh my goodness. There just seems to be one detestable thing after another. If you were reading through that book this week, did you see that? Did you see the sin of Israel laid out before you? Did you uh, read that story of Jephthah? His daughter that he... Okay, I went to the scholars. They're trying to convince me I didn't read what I read. They're trying to convince me he didn't kill because he made a vow. He didn't kill his daughter when she came out of his house. That that's not how I should read that story. Because you see, they apparently want to do the same thing that we're so prone to do. Here's this hero of faith, but he is not a hero because he violates God's law. And then this corruption is constantly around him. I'm pretty sure he killed his daughter. It's terrible. It's an awful story. Did you read about that guy, Micah? What a winner. I have a nephew, Micah. I always liked his name until I was reminded of this guy. <laughs> Micah who sets himself up an idol and gets himself a Levite to be his priest. How, how can a Levite do that? This corruption, and then other people are trying to steal his priest. Why would you want that priest? That's a terrible story. There is so much evidence of humanity's inability to keep God's law in the book of Judges that we continue over and over and over again to violate what God has asked of us. That we won't worship Him as Creator alone and trust in Him alone. And Samson is no hope to me. The guy seems to have some pretty good parents. At least a really good mom. And yet it isn't enough. Even the, the end. You remember the story from when you were a child. It's this great mighty Samson. That's not the story that I saw. I read about a uh, boastful, arrogant, um, lustful, greedy guy who did, he just did whatever he wanted. That's what I read about. And his end 
doesn't make up for all of that. How could it? That he has one last moment. And then, Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin, if you were reading that story this week, their sin is so uh, disgusting and awful that the people of Israel are rallied to wipe out Benjamin, to destroy this tribe. And uh, if you ask me, I think they needed to be wiped out. I'm sure my uh, friend, the Apostle Paul, the member of the tribe of Benjamin, doesn't agree with me, but at least in this moment I can hold on to some hope that God always spares a remnant, that they will repent and hopefully return. But Benjamin and their sin. So I was so eager to turn the page and go to Ruth. Did you do that this week? I love the story of Ruth. If you were in Bill's Bible class this morning, he's, he's following along also with our reading. If you were in his class this morning, he talked about the contrast of the darkness seen in the book of Judges and this light that is seen in the book of Ruth. But the important thing to remember is that these worlds are both the same. These things are happening at the same time. Ruth I mean, is entering a culture that is reflected in the book of Judges. And Naomi uh, is just a member of this, these people who are so corrupted. And Ruth is a foreigner. And there's a moment in the story where Boaz is reminding Ruth to be very careful. Make sure that she stays with uh, his workers and that he tells his workers to make sure to protect her. Well, because Boaz is smart. He knows where he lives. And the world around him is not wonderful. It is corrupt and dark. And so this story of Ruth, as much as I enjoy it, it still takes place in the context of this sinful book of Judges and these people who should know the righteousness of God, but the whole moment is summed up at the end of the book to describe what we've been reading about. In Judges it says, In those days Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. You see, it isn't enough to have an eternal judge who goes out and wars against our enemies. Apparently the people of Israel, God's people, need an eternal king as well who has the authority, because you know why God institutes kings, right? He sets up rulers and authorities to punish the wrongdoer in their own country. He enforces law and rule on his own people. Because it isn't enough to have a judge who vindicates us and saves us from our enemies. We need an eternal king who will actually enforce God's rule in our heart. Because without that, we're just going to repeat the same cycle. Now, Ruth reveals a very different picture. The story of the righteous redeemer. I don't mean Boaz. I mean the young woman, Ruth. I really think that's the righteous redeemer in the story. And I think the fact that she's a foreigner is supposed to humble those who are God's people. That other people aren't acting that way. But Ruth the foreigner, she is faithful. She seeks justice. She practices mercy. I mean, Boaz, he's really great. I like him. And I'm sure he was ruggedly handsome. But the amazing redeemer in the story is Ruth. Because she will not waver, she will not falter, she will not give up. She works hard every day to make sure that she can provide for her mother-in-law. And she has a loyalty that surpasses everything else around her. It's the point of the, the book that Ruth is amazed. And it is that quality seen in Ruth that I think causes Boaz to notice her, and genuinely fall in love with this young woman who is not an Israelite, but who is one in her heart. 
because of her actions, that she keeps God's law. She cares when no one else does. And it was that hope that I was going to get to the book of Ruth that I held on to all week. Because I needed to see that love wins. I need to be reminded of that. I need to be reminded that love can conquer. That it will conquer the ugliness of the world all around us. I certainly saw that this week. The ugliness. I saw uh, hopelessness. I saw hurt, pain. I saw lost dreams, rejection. You see, I lived in teenage world. And it is a messy, ugly place. And it needs love to win. It desperately needs that. Did you see any of the ugliness of the world this week? I'm really glad that while I made it to Ruth, my friend John was there to remind me of what he had seen. Because it reshapes my understanding. He was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. It still boggles my mind every time I read the first chapter of John. To read that the power of the Creator, the Creator Himself, the one who gives life to all, who is the life of life, took on this broken form and came into our ugly mess. That He made Himself one of us. That Jesus came just as He promised. And that his coming offers you and I the opportunity to become a child of God. That's an amazing <laughs> promise. I sometimes have to remind my students, outside of Jesus, we are not children of God. It's a hard thing because the world wants to disagree with but outside of Jesus, we are not children of God. We are children of sin and death, destruction, loss. We are children of Adam and Eve. Past that. We have no hope. But with the coming of Jesus, he says, you are a child of God. Because we are adopted. We are adopted by God. Through Jesus. It is not surprising in the beginning of this book that the people of Israel, those the children of Abraham, the children of the promise, who know the stories and who should, they can even recite the prophets. They know the promises of God, and yet they reject Jesus. They choose instead their sinful practices, their their righteousness found in themselves. They reject Jesus in favor of their own kingdom, their own path. They reject this true king. Yeah, they rallied around this great champion. I mean, who wouldn't? The words that he spoke and the food he could make. But they still clung to sin instead. I think Terry's words this morning are very true. We need to cling to Jesus, not what he is. Nicodemus helps me see this uh, mess that Jesus steps into. This noble ruler who seeks Jesus in the cover of darkness. He 
doesn't come into the light. It's like John is setting him up as the prototype. They like darkness more than light. They move around in it because they're afraid the light will expose their deeds. And what deeds would Nicodemus hate to have exposed? I think he's afraid someone will think he actually thinks Jesus is his disciple. He is the Messiah. That he actually believes in this kingdom that Jesus is proclaiming. Because if he professes that his power, his position, his privilege, his reputation, it will cost him all of that. So rather than step out into the light, he goes to Jesus in the dark. And he reminds me very much of the book of Judges. Know what is right, but you choose instead sin. He can go to Jesus, just not in true faith, in true obedience, true righteousness. And then John immediately contrasts Nicodemus with the woman at the well. Granted, she didn't plan to seek this Messiah in daylight, but there he was in the middle of the day, the sun up shining, and when she discovered who he was, she ran and told everyone who he was. She confesses in broad daylight for everybody to see. Nicodemus just fades into the background, back into the darkness. And then we see it again, this thread, this promise of this Redeemer, the one who in faithfulness will make it possible for us to actually become children of God. Jesus spoke these words to Nicodemus. I think that they're probably the, the most well-known Christian text in the entire world. The one who has, no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light, and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly, plainly that what he has done has been done through God. You ever wonder if those Israelites ever bothered to ask them why God continued to visit destruction on them? Surely in several hundred years they would have paused to think of it. Do you ever think they realized it was their sin? Their rejection of who God was? I mean, we know, right? So certainly they must have known. How could they not? It just seems that so few are willing to actually change and decide to be else or someone else to serve something, someone greater than self. I know that we're supposed to be a confessing people, but we're not very good at it, are we? We know that we're supposed to be a confessing people, but I think that uh, power, position, pride, reputation, cause us to act more like Nicodemus right. than they do the woman at the top. I think we end up being more like those judges than we do Ruth. I think we know that.
But if we're not willing to confess it, church, we're no better than our ancestors that we read about and we go, how could they? I know we need a king. I know we need more than just the judge to rescue us. I know that we need a king to impose his rule. I think we need to confess, to pledge, as Ruth did. And the story begins because she is willing to make a pledge to serve, to love, to be faithful, even unto death. And I think we need to be reminded that that's the pledge we already took. And we need to confess again. That it is Jesus alone. Nothing we do but Jesus alone that can save. It is Jesus alone who is worthy. I want to ask you, and, and I really mean it, are you willing to confess again? Are you willing to profess again that it is Jesus alone? That he is the eternal judge, the righteous eternal king, and that you know you need his rule imposed in your life. That you would lift him up and say, begin with me. Instead of saying, look out there. Ask that king to set right your world first. Yes. And to confess it in broad daylight. If you have never claimed Jesus Christ as Lord, we don't want the opportunity to pass you by. We would encourage you to profess Jesus, the Son of God, crucified, buried, raised, and that you would join him in that death, by being baptized, being raised to new life, and being empowered by His Spirit. We would encourage you to do that. And if you're a believer who knows that this heart is a mess, and it needs to be set right, and it needs the rule of that eternal King, we would encourage you, implore you to come forward as we stand together and all of us confess as we sing these words. Amen.